All right. I believe I did it this the right way this time. Okay. Amen. All right. You got it. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to our Wednesday night discussion. I am so elated tonight um, to be the facilitator of these powerful, powerful speakers. So let's do some housekeeping. Let's do some little cleanup real quick and everything. Um, this is part um, four. Um, we had three powerful discussions this month in Men's Month. We know that the theme is masculinity is genderless, and we had some powerful discussions. But tonight we are talking about reconnecting, reconnecting our sexuality to our spirituality. And we have some powerhouses in here today. And I am so glad to have them. So let me just set it up, set the room up for everybody to enjoy themselves. So what's going to happen tonight is basically is this is going to be a living room discussion. Hey, and we're going to invite you into the living room and have a seat and hear this discussion about sexuality and spirituality. And so we want to invite you to share this, this, this conversation tonight. We want you to groove with us. And, and um, my student, Kurji, is on the other side um, looking for questions, if you have them or whatever. But we also are asking for today, if you have enjoyed all four of these and, and you like to see more, and you like to support us right now, we in the phase one of building a Niramaya Justice Center here in Charleston, South Carolina, which will be huge because there is nothing of color, especially in the LGBTQ community. And as an open queer African-American pastor, I'm excited of this. And our cash app is dollar favor buy. If you like to, as my grandmama said, if you like to put some pennies in the, in the bank, come on, do it, do it, do it. We need it. It could be $2, 5000 or whatever it is. We need the thing. Well, I'm not going to delay this living room kind of conversation. So I'm not going to induce none of them because they got a voice. And my God, y'all need to put a seatbelt on them ready. And so I'm going to give each one of them an opportunity to kind of tell us who they are, where they are, what they're affiliated, whatever they is. And then we're going to get these questions rolling tonight. And, um, somebody go. Well, good evening, everyone. I am Apostle Dr. D. Fields Montgomery out of Fayetteville, North Carolina. I'm the presiding prelate for United Ministries in Christ Fellowship and pastor of our local church here. It is an honor to be here with uh, Reverend Sear Arrington and the other amazing, amazing panelists, which I've met Reverend Kevin in person before. It's good to see you this today. And I've seen a lot about uh, Pastor Griffin and on social media. So it's good to be on here today. And uh, welcome each and everyone. I guess I'll go next. Um, I am, I don't like to say it, but I guess I am Pastor um, Benjamin Griffin. Just call me brother. I am fine with it. Um, but I am from Beaufort, South Carolina, but I now reside in Columbia, South Carolina with my husband and our foster babies. So um, I am glad to be here tonight and I'm glad to meet everyone as well on this panel. And I look forward to what's about to happen. Amen, amen, amen. Let me, uh, I'm Elder Reverend Kevin E. Taylor, uh, Senior Pastor of Unity Fellowship Church, New Ark in Newark, New Jersey. Um, I'm also Director of LGBTQ Services for an agency here for NJCRI. Um, also in Newark, New Jersey. Um, excited, you know, uh, family is here. So let's enlighten some folk and lift some stuff off people's shoulders as we get ready to come out of pride and walk into our full lives, right? Pride is more than a t-shirt, let's go. Amen, and that's my elder right there. So oh. let me just go on and not getting people to guess that they know who this man is, amen. 
I am Reverend Robert Arrington. I am the pastor of Unity Fellowship, which was birthed in 2010, and we are on 13 years, going on 13 more years. I am excited to be, I reside in um, Charleston, South Carolina, on a little island called James Island, and this is where I am. I am also um, outside of the movement. I am also a seer, which most people call me more than they call me pastor. And I am also proudly uh, in this month of pride. I am so very proud to be on the list of what open queer, lesbian, and bisexual and transgender offers. I am the author of my first book, God's Masterpiece. And I am excited to be facilitating on this discussion. So as my grandmama said, let's go on, get in the kitchen, let's get the cocktails going, let's do it in the name of Jesus. So if my sissy come out tonight, that's okay, hallelujah. Anyway, um, so the first question will be, okay, because I, I, today as I was trying to prepare for this and I was looking and, and tweaking the questions that I sent out, um, I, I want you, we want to start off with what is sexuality and spirituality? What is sexuality and spirituality? Now you can give your definition or you can go on to the, the dictionary or you can go to your grandmama, but I want to know what is your definition of sexuality and spirituality? Okay. Uh, I'm going first. Since I, since I went last, okay. last, last time I'll go first. For me, this is such a beautiful conversation because sexuality and spirituality are connected. They are one. You know, I think uh, for so long, you know, because we say homosexuality, heterosexuality, bisexuality, we have snapped them off, you know, like they are some separate appendage, but they are part of the, total the totality of who we are. So sexual what sexuality and spirituality are how you are uh, assigned, refined, and defined to show up on the, on the planet. And that looks like what it looks like for each of us. And so um, I think if we could, I'm glad to have this conversation because if we could talk about sexuality with a little more space and a little more grace, it would stop being such an ick in the church, such a ooh, and we could just be, because everybody's just being. That me. Um, I guess I'll go then. Um when I think of sexuality, um, I think of someone's feelings, thoughts, or attractions, or even behaviors, um, maybe towards someone. Um, and on the flip side of that, growing up, I've been taught that spirituality is just a connection with you and God. <laughs> um, so growing up, it's always been something that is totally separate, but then that's only if, that's only if you're quote unquote, not a heterosexual. Because then if you are, then when you are engaged with someone, especially sexually, then you're, quote unquote, having that spiritual interaction. So um, I've always been taught that it's been something totally separate. And only when I lay down with a woman that I am married to, that I am able to now connect spiritually um, on that level and to commence to then have children, so to speak. Um, so it's never been taught to me that these two are something that is like intertwined, um, but it's always been taught that it's a negative thing if your sexuality is not a heteronorm thing. So then if it's not heteronorm, then you can't be spiritual. So that's something that I'm still working to unlearn. But when I think of those two things, I automatically default to what I was taught, that these are two different entities. But um, just like um, Pastor Reverend just said, like, if we would stop doing this in the church, we would see that these two things are like one. 
And I, I kind of echo what's already been said um, with the addition of, I just, when I think of sexuality, first of all, I do not think of it as a context into identity. I think um, it's safe to say that sexuality is genderless um, and it's one of the creatives. It's one of the ways where an individual is able to share themselves, express themselves for um, what they like, what they enjoy according to their makeup or their personality. And so that's when you ask me what I think of sexuality, that's kind of where, where, where I rest at with that. So it was some things hidden on here and about the process of understanding one and connection and all the things. But the next question that I had is, what process did you come to to connect or reconnect your spirituality to your um, your sexuality to your spirituality? What what process? How would you help someone who is in the process of? connecting or reconnecting their sexuality to their spirituality? You like you want to go first, uh, brother Benjamin? I was thinking, <laughs> so I'm trying to process. Okay, well, <laughs> while you, <laughs> I'll kind of jump in there on that. Um, you know, I want to, to initiate my response with this by saying the most difficult challenge I had with reconciling my spirituality with my sexuality was the um, unlearning of environmental influences. Um, that played a lot. Uh, within my heart, I was always at peace with who I was. The anxiety and the weight of the stressors of everything else was really externally driven. And it, it was internally uh, enhanced because my desire was roundabout saying, not wanting to be different. Uh, my environment, what was set up, wife, kids, go to school, get an education, get a job, start a business, make babies, you know, travel, enjoy life. And all of those things still align, except when it came for, to the point of who I, who I love or who I wanted to be with and who I felt uh, driven to intimately. That's where my, my big, biggest challenge was. And really it came when I stopped talking. I went to a period where I just stopped talking and I just prayed. I didn't go to nobody asking them for permission. I stopped asking people to explain to me or stop seeking advice from other people because I realized that the truth of the matter is as humans, we all have that thing in our life that, that we struggle with accepting. And it's not because we don't want to live that truth. It's because we are uncomfortable uh, with the rejection that we will encounter from living that truth from the people we love so much who we soon learn do not love us with the same measure of love that we love them. And so my, 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 my biggest struggle was getting to that point where I disconnected from everything normal, disconnected from family, disconnected from church. I didn't disconnect from God. I disconnected from family. I disconnected from church until I got to the place where I could get off my face of crying and praying to God and off of the therapist's couch, because it took us, it took months of therapy for me to where I could bring myself into oneness. And once I got back to oneness, I could deal with the people I love who were challenged with dealing with the love of me that did not look like what they expected. Um, Good brother. Okay. Y'all, 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 y'all some, y'all some preachers on here, but um, <laughs> I, I will say that growing up, I grew up in small town of Beaufort, South Carolina. So I went from a Baptist church, then my mother moved over, well, my paternal grandmother grazed me, but I called her mama. 
but I moved to Pentecostal Apostolic and it was hounded on, hounded on that this is the way to do things. This is the way you do this. This is the way you do that. This is how your spirit man, da, 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 all that good stuff. Sheltered all my life. My process began when I enrolled to go to a university campus. <laughs> I got a taste of life and I was like, wait, I have been doing this wrong for 18 years. I need to sit down and figure this out. I was forced to date a girl. It felt weird to even kiss her. It, it was just weird. And then when I got to college, I was like, now hold on. They told me I can't do this. Oh, I'm gonna go to hell. I'm gonna do this. And it took for me to realize, y'all pray with me, that the body of Christ is man using the Bible to manipulate those into doing things either they want to be done or how it needs to per be perceived. And it took me a long time. Like, God, why in the world would you make me like this if this is what they showed me in the Bible of how my life is supposed to be lived? And if that's the case, why did you bring me here? That made me fall into depression. Like, I can't be doing this right. I, I just can't. Dating men and I felt like myself. And then I came to the realization of this. If I had a relationship with God, like how they taught me to have a relationship, but the caveat to that is I am the person who's supposed to go to God for you versus me go to God for myself to dictate how he wants my life to be. It took me years to figure out why in the world would my pastor allow me not to go to God for myself and they be the middle person. I can go to God to an extent. And it's like, y'all say the veil was ripped and all this other stuff, but I can't go beyond the veil. <laughs> So it took me years to figure that out. And then when I finally got to the place of, I can love and serve God and still love who I love, be used by God, and the blessings still flow, my life is still ordered in his steps, why in the world would I live in bondage? <laughs> just so that I can fit what it is that you all are trying to get me to portray. I was snatched from being an elder, youth leader, everything. That thing sent me into such a depression that I could not figure out how to reconnect to God. But it took an old church mother who told me, baby, you have the power to dictate how God responds to you. You better get on your face. And if nobody else comes in the room, Jesus will come in that room. I can't tell you what the answer is, only he can. And when I started to follow her advice, I simply heard God tell me this, never try to use the Bible to tell people about your lifestyle. Don't try to use Jacob and David and Ruth and Naomi. That is not what I sent you for. Live your life on purpose and let your light shine and I'll do the rest. And from that moment on, I told my mama that raised me, baby, if you ain't with it, God is with it. So what's what it's gonna be? <laughs> Um, so I, my advice is to know him for yourself and never try to use that Bible as a weapon to tell people about yourself or your lifestyle because only God can define who you are because he created you. It's a tool, but we should not use it as a weapon to tell somebody about ourselves. Amen. So um, 
Hmm. I was born a fat, black, asthmatic, gay nerd in the projects of Southwest DC. So I've always been different. Say so, Reverend Taylor. Lived in the library. I got I got into more fights about messing up the curve than I did for any boy who wanted to drop an F bomb at me. So my coming out story doesn't exist except that on a, a cold December day in 1977, Louise Taylor asked her 13 year old son uh, if he was ever going to get married. And for the longest time, even my mother and I uh, tried to remember why we were having that conversation in 1977. And if you uh, if you do some research, you know, though there was a former Miss America, former beauty uh, uh, pageant contestant named Anita Bryant, who had decided in the late 70s that she was going to be the moral majority for white America in Florida. And they were working on ensuring that homosexuals couldn't adopt. So other things came up, including marriage, because she was using the fact that homosexuals couldn't marry as the reason why they shouldn't be able to adopt, because they could never be a family. My mother asked her erudite son, reading the uh, the Washington Post in four quarters, you know, you fold the paper like this, the fold in half and fold it again, so you just read. And she asked my little adult mini man, you know, if I would ever get married. And I looked over the paper and said to my mother, yes, ma'am, as soon as they make it legal. That journey stayed with me as I, you know, as we went through our, uh, my childhood at Carroll Baptist Church in Southwest DC under the leadership of the Reverend Leroy S. Waldo, who was blind, preached like T.D. Jakes and played the piano like Ray Charles. So we used to run the church, like you choir, senior choir, whoever was singing, they was gonna get it in. But if the Waldo singer sang, that was gonna be a treat. And so he taught us about the unconditional, unbreakable, infathomable love of God. So all me and God were at the place where God was like my best friend. I would be taking the test and I'd be like, I don't know the answer. God would be like, you know that answer. Walk through it, talk through it. I was like, it's C. God said, is it C? You're right, it's D, because I did the math. So it was like that until, and then he died when I turned 15. And then a new preacher came in, talking talk that was unloved. You know what I mean? It was unkindness. It was very much about, um, you know, the stuff, homosexuality, the Bible say, all of the stuff you were just talking about, brother, uh, Pastor Griffin, all of that stuff. <laughs> and it was just kind of like, wait, wait. So just at 15, I was already working. I was a, you know, honor student. So my mother, who went to church early and worked in the kitchen and did all of that kind of mother's boy, usher boy stuff, didn't know for several Sundays that I wasn't in church. And for one Sunday she did, she said, baby, what's going on? You don't go to church no more? And I was like, I don't like this preacher. And she said, um, she said, uh, well, you go to church. Uh, so come this Sunday, if he say something stupid, because she was like, I, she was hearing some other rumbling. She said, if he say something, then you can just leave. And he decided that Sunday that Bible was a homosexual, were burning a fire in hell. And my mother looked back from the, you know, from the second row of the usher, baby, baby. That was like, get out of here, because she knew my mouth. And instead of going, you know, how you're supposed to go to the left and down the side and around. I went to the middle and walked out back. Like, please say something so I can cuss this whole building down. And, but I broke. Like, it was a moment when it was like, wait. So somebody just told me my best friend hated me. Think about that. My best friend hates me. So the thing they're saying in front of me is a lie. And the truth is, behind the scenes, they're cutting my throat and want me to go to hell. And so... On a stormy Sunday night, up, you know, it's very dramatic, but it's my truth. I go outside on the balcony of my first four project, projects to talk to God. I was like, look, we, I thought we was cool. I thought that you loved me and no matter what, that, you know, we were connected because every time I need you, you help me when I'm counting food stamps going to the store. You help me with my homework. You help me when bullies come after me. You always help me. So I haven't even done anything. So if what they're saying is I don't, you know, it's true. And it's wrong, just take it. I was like, you know, just like take back a sweater. Just take it and I'll be fine because I'm used to it anyway. I say, but I need to know that you and I are good. I need to know that no matter what I go through, you're going to be here with me. So I need a sign. It's a Sunday night. I need a sign, Lord. I need a sign. I go to school at Jefferson Junior High School the very next Monday morning. And somewhere between that lunch period, that break after breakfast, but before first period, a boy I liked since first grade, I mean, fourth grade, and now we're in the ninth. A boy that I liked since fourth grade 
pull me to the side, almost trembling. He said, oh, I don't know what it was, but last night something told me to tell you today that I like. For me, God has spoken. So when I say it's melded, I got the answer from somebody who told me God told him to tell me. You know what I mean? He wasn't. I just, it took, and so that for me has been the bedrock of my faith is that me and God got closer because somebody tried to break us up, tried to pull us apart. And God used my attraction. God used my sexual, my sexual orientation, my, my, my sexuality and said, you want to know how much I love you? Boy, come over here and tell everyone you like him. And that for me was everything. And it's funny. So even, yeah, and I don't think I've ever shared this story out loud. So I go through life and that's junior high school, high school. And I'm, you know, the, the gay dude. And somebody wanted to, you know, I, I hadn't done much dating in high school because, you know, communities of color and black communities, especially, you know, boys knew how to hit on you. Boys knew how to ask for sex. They didn't know how to be in relationship. And I wanted relationship. And so I remember uh, at one point asking this girl to go with me to a Jocelyn Brown concert at, Con uh, Con at the Carter Baron Amphitheater in D.C. And somewhere in picking her up, I realized, oh my gosh, she thinks it's a date. I just wanted somebody to go to the, to the, to the concert with me. I was like, oh God, she thinks it's a date. I'm tall and, you know, deep voice. So I guess I got it, but I ain't want it. <laughs> and um, I was like, okay, God, I don't know what to do. So we went to the concert, we had a good time. And afterwards, she wanted to go back to her house. And I knew we were just friends. I knew I wasn't losing my virginity that night or doing anything stupid. But, you know, it was cool to just be sitting on the living room floor, just talking to her. And when I tell you her fine six foot two, light skin, curly hair, thick brother came down the stairs and looked at me and my face went. And we hugged and said goodnight. I was like, I see what you did there, God. God was like, just in case you were trying to do something stupid and blame it on me. Here comes, here comes the Holy Ghost. And it put me right together on a Friday night. Sunday, I was at the altar just laughing. Like, I see what you did, God. That was funny. That was funny because I don't know if she thought I was going to kiss her or not. But thanks for making sure I didn't do nothing stupid. I, I think there was something important that I'm going to um hopefully you stay in the vehicle with me and walk with me because I heard something and and something was speaking to me when I was listening to each one of you and the thing that came to me is most people confuse religion and spirituality together so the question is how would you help someone be because before one unpacks their sexuality to their spirituality, they first have to understand what spirituality is because a lot of people don't know what it is. So how would you help someone journey who really does it because all they know is religion? And you know, for me, um, religion almost killed me. Ah, say that ten times. Yeah, religion almost killed me. Religion had me marry a whole woman, and knowing this sissy didn't like no woman at, in the name of Jesus, but I did it in the name of the church. But spirituality is what was that resurrection power. That's what brought me back to life. So let me not start preaching. But anyway, I'm asking the question. How do you unpack that understanding from religion to spirituality? God has the nerve to take a wordsmith and give him the word, right? And so sometimes, you know, you know, just like in the Sunday, I preached at a uh, big church in New York in the middle of the Pride Fest, um, and we unpack uh, the sanctified man, right? Re we get so lost in some church words that we polish them in, 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 in gold dust and diamonds and just lift them up to heaven without taking the time to study to show ourselves approved. To do something religiously is to do it structurally and consistently, right? People who listen to Beyonce religiously. I eat my, you know, people who drink their coffee at nine o'clock with three sugars religiously. It's like instruction, right? When the word has come to set the captive free, free, and people want to live in bondage and call it religion. They want to live in 
order, like they told me to do it, right? Because a whole lot of people, remember in the Bible, there was, a, there was a season, remember apostles, there was a season where they were without king and they were like, we need a king. Right. We're stupid. We can't handle this by mm -hmm. ourselves. That's it's it. the same thing with religion. I, my pastor said, my pastor said, but the word says to study to show yourself approved. No, but my pastor said, well, what would I read? My pastor said, that's what they did back in the day. Un, 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 unfurl the Torah, the word said, and then roll it back up. We, these just died to give us access to it, and we still act like we're on a landline. We got a whole you in our hands every day and still want to be struggling like, well, I don't know how to unpack this for myself. Yeah, you do. And and I'll say this, um, just like Reverend said, with religion, it's something that is consistent or there's some type of structure to it. And I had to learn <clears throat> that in religion, it tells me how to worship, or it tells me how to praise, or it tells me how to live. And for so long, again, like I said, I went to college and I was like, I don't know what to do. I haven't been to church on Sunday. Oh my God, I'm gonna go to hell. Oh Jesus, oh Lord. And it's just like, my spirituality had nothing to do with <laughs> what they were teaching me so in unpacking this i had to learn that religion is so structured it's damaging to my spirituality and sexuality if i were to allow religion the organism the whole construction of it to mm -hmm. consume me i would be a detriment to myself I would not have been able to get to where I needed to be. The first step in this process is to determine, am I living religiously <laughs> or am I truly living my true authentic self, even in the vein of spirituality and my sexuality? Because if I'm going to allow religion to dictate how I live my life, I'm sorry, my brother and my sister. That is not spirituality. Religion will tell you how to live. If and I, I love, I love my, I love my good old, you know, Baptist and apostolic folk. But you know, and I may knock down some walls, but hey, you know, you you can't smoke, you can't drink, you can't go to this place, you can't go to that place, your car can't be seen there, or you ain't saved, or you don't got the spirit. And it's just like, well, I didn't know if I turned my car left, <laughs> I wouldn't be in the spirit. But I had to learn all of these things because I was telling people they're going to hell for just saying hell or a cuss word. Right. And they were going just to help like, us say it out. Hello? <laughs> and I was oh, just Pastor. like, I've been telling people <laughs> this, and now I'm being detrimental to their process <laughs> because of the religion <laughs> that has been instilled in me. So I tell people all the time, take a step back and examine, is this religion or is this spirituality? And, and my response, and if I could jump in real quickly, is simply this. Religion is only good for a time. It has an expiration date. Religion is limited, where spirituality is limitless. The word of God says that it is a charge that we die daily and that our mind is evolving. He said it is renewing. Let your let this mind, which is in Christ, right, be renewed, right? And so anytime that you're rejecting the renewing of, of your mind because of what it's always been, you are then limiting God and saying that I'll sit in religion and hold myself back from progress. The same setup of life that was happening in the earlier stages before Christ was similarly a different um, lifestyle after Christ, which means there was a 
change in lifestyle. There was a change in systems where, you know, women and men were permitted to divorce. You, you find if you look over our, our lifestyle now, when I was coming up in the 80s, women couldn't wear dress, wear certain women if you was holy. Now, if you was in holiness, yeah, Pentecostal, apostolic, women didn't wear dresses, they didn't wear makeup, um, and some covered they had and they wore head coverings. But as life evolved, you know, you were allowed to divorce, you were allowed to remarry, you realized that your freedom in Christ came from spiritual growth. And so how is it that we can have spiritual growth in certain areas, but in other areas say we can't? And when you're in that type of um, dichotomy, you're in a place of religiosity. And it is our charge as people of God, as progressive individuals, as individuals who are peculiar and embracing our peculiarity and saying, Christ is still in me and I am still in him and he has still anointed me. And if you turn your back on me, it does not mean God has turned his back on me. And so then we are charged to stand when the oppressors look at us and say, well, we won't give you our resources. We won't come to your church. We won't like your Facebook page. We won't come to no more of your holiday functions. We won't invite you on no more of your trips. Well, that is all right because spirituality is a creative gene. And as long as I'm in a creative gene, God will create me a family. God will create me a network. God will create me a business. That's why he said, God be for me. It is more than the entire world against me. So the challenge is, and the question is, how free do you really want to live? That's the, that's, that's really what it come down to. How free do you really want to live? Because only you can stop what God is trying to really do in your life. And what God is doing in your life has not been seen. We say these scriptures, eyes have not seen, neither have ears heard what the son of man. But, but then when God began to do these things and put these things in our lives, we begin to say, oh, this ain't God. This ain't God. This ain't God. I don't know how to do this. You're not supposed to know how to do it. Walk by sight. That part. And, 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 and oh, that's good. Now we're preaching. The eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, and it hasn't even entered into the consciousness of man. Right? That's not so, entered. When somebody asked me once, how is it that you are so okay being a man of faith and, you know, a black gay man? My response was, God keeps on doing great things for me, and God knows it's me, right? Yes. So, I'm not accidentally anointed. I am not, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I, I'm purposely blessed. And so, like you said, we have to be clear that we were made to be a peculiar people that even peculiar people are going to look at peculiarly. Birds look at peacocks and go, how oh, you got all that and don't fly? I wasn't born to fly, right? And so okay. it, it, it baffles the, you've been able to be pastor. You've been able to say my husband and our kids. It baffles people's minds because that is what we are called and commissioned to do. That's you it. About it you, you want to be able to, to say, and you talk, you talk about this good apostle. You talk about somebody finding out because of a newspaper article in the New York Times, and they said, oh, you were invited to our Martin Luther King event, and now we can't invite you back because now we know. And then the, right. the next year, <laughs> the next year, the paper that came, that outed you, comes to your service to say, well, what y'all doing for Martin Luther King? God says, let me show you. Let, let me show you. Anointed. Do my prophet no harm. T don't touch my anointing. Mm -hmm. Leave it alone. And people don't get that because they 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 want to see they they can't receive because of that church that religiosity can't believe that God I can't be in this I couldn't have done this. exactly I couldn't have done this for myself exactly and when you give God the glory while they're while they're scratching their heads and God be glorified and the enemy be horrified bless it God still bless it y'all preaching <laughs> my God. But let me say this, because we, we, we're we going good. I feel God. And, and the thing is with me is, I want to touch on this, because it was strangely as I was preparing to facilitate these with your uh, three powerful preachers, and including you, Pastor Gat, <laughs> and you're anointed, and great things are coming your way. But anyway. Yeah. There is, let me say this is, I, I, I saw so many articles 
that was confusing sexuality with sex. Do you feel this is the reason that the African American church or the black church or whatever terminology you want to use really does not even dive into teaching about sexuality? Because my understanding growing up is you can turn off the lights and do it, but we just ain't gonna talk about it. You know what I'm saying? And that is the reason why so many of us are HIV positive because we had that same consciousness. We just do it and we don't protect ourselves and then we get the results of being positive. Okay, so I the want, thing- I want go to ahead. possibly go first, but I want, to, I want to shut that down because it's why so many, it's why HIV got loose in the black gay community. It's why so many, you know, so many mothers have children out of wedlock. It's why we have so many broken families. So we don't talk about sex, period. Period. Okay. Period. We don't talk about we don't talk about the daughter who is actually the mother. We don't talk about you know no. the uncle is actually the father. We don't talk about the fact that the mother that the mother and the daughter have been raped by the same man. We don't talk about none of that. Right. And that's why they're frightened of our being out because our out is being truth tellers. And if the truth come out, it's gonna all come out. So you shut up and go back in the closet because if you open this door, everything's coming out. Everything's coming out. That's why they'd rather get rid of baby, you know, baby you, baby her. That's why mm -hmm. they would rather get rid of because they need all the secrets to stay under lock and key. Um, and I think when I, um, and especially when I hear this question, I always go back to, as um, Reverend just said, um, the church, everything is taboo. You don't question why. You just go along with what is said, and that is how you govern yourself accordingly. You don't ask why they wait to have marriage, but you don't ask why the pastor want to only see this one at the service, or you don't ask why the deacon only want to go to this person's house to check on. You don't ask or question why, and the church has got to get to a place where it's supposed to be, excuse me, I said I don't like using church. The institution has to get to a place of we are going to be a safe space and allow these things to be talked about. Because if I had a safe place, I would have been able to ask, well, how do you do this? Or how do you do that? And uh -huh. it goes beyond just the sexual aspect. But if this is someone whom I am dating, how do I do that? Or how do we court each other? As you say, we have to court. Are we supposed to just sit there and look at each other at the bowling alley? What do we do? Do I open the door for this? woman or do I or do I help this man through the, what do I do we as the people that go to these institutions have got to be able to be open enough to have someone to come to us and say what do I do or what does it look like I have never heard or seen a condom until I was almost 16 years old nobody said how to use it nobody said when you open the pack you got to Put it on this way. No, Nobody told me any anything. And these, and I hate to say this, but these children are inquisitive. If you tell them not to do something, they are typically going to do the total opposite to find out what it is. So we've got to get to a place where we're now open and receptive, whether they're a child or an adult. I need to know where your mind is. What do you feel about this? How do you feel about this? Was that a good feeling? Well, then you know you that may not be the avenue you want to go, or maybe you're just not into quote unquote this or what. But we do not allow ourselves, we as even adults, and I had to learn this in my marriage. Uh, why are you acting the way you act? Oh, you don't like that. Okay, well, then can we try that? And we as adults will get into marriages knowing that this is not what we would like or this is what we don't like. And even if that is the person for you, we don't have the hard conversation of this is what I like. This is what I don't like. This is what happened to me as a child or an adult. So this is why my reaction is the way it is if this were to happen to me. But we don't allow that. I tell my husband all the time and this is just this is being completely honest and real 
I am not calling you my daddy because I did not meet my daddy until I was 21 years old. So even if we're in the midst of doing something, daddy will never come out of my mouth because this is why I have the daddy issue because I did not meet this man until I was 21 years old. Had I not explained that to him, not, not being that he would want that or anything, but this is why I won't say daddy. So this is our honest conversation that I had to have with him. And then I had to go back to my mama. Listen, girl, you did not want to call nobody daddy, even if they were a father figure to me, because I had this issue. But I had to been open enough to realize that this is the root cause of this. And it all stems back to childhood when you told me as a parent, I am your mother and father. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i'm not calling nobody no daddy because you told me you my daddy and i had to process that now how this woman is mama and daddy so we've got to be open enough and receptive to receive someone even in their childhood or adulthood to say this is how i feel this is what that feels like I don't like this. I don't feel right when I'm with this person or I don't feel right when I'm with that person or I don't like how this feels, but we shut it down immediately. That ain't what you're supposed to be doing. You're going to hell. <laughs> so yeah. I just think that we have to be more open and receptive. I can agree. I can, I can agree with that. You know, and I'll, I'll say this, the, the very thing that we lack light to is the very thing that infects and kills us. And when you talk about the institution of the church, because we didn't have conversations about sex, then our peers and our friends and other individuals who were immature sexually was allowed to influence the community as a whole. And, 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 and it contaminated many of us uh, across the spectrum. And, and, and so you can't, when, when, I, when I look at this piece of it, I don't even lock it into just the LGBT plus community. Um, women are mistreated. Men don't understand their value. They don't know what they like. All they know, they like sex. And as long as it's pretty and soft, then they want it. I mean, you know, we, we're having a, a mature conversation. It's, it's, we, we lack the depth. And it's the same thing in the institution of the church. We have perfected formality, but we lack the depth of execution. We, we have failure with commitment. We have failure with endurance. We have failure with faith. If we get mad, we quit. If, we, if it's not given what we want it to give, we, we don't have the endurance to work it out. And so from, from, from conception, my environment, even though I had strong women in my life and, and some strong men in my life, there was a lack of execution of death. And so you taught me that God loved me and you taught me that I should love all people. But then when it was things that you didn't like about people, you limited the love you give. And so as a young man, there was a part of me that embraced this wisdom. And I could see very clearly that there was a breakdown in this thing we call the love of Christ. And I understood from a young age that humans did not love the way Christ loved. And so one, the church is in sin at large because we do not love our, our neighbor as Christ love the church. That was the first commandment, that you love as Christ loved the church. And secondly, after you fall in love with Christ and you follow him and understand his love and how to live in his love, then you can love your neighbor as you love yourself because loving Christ would teach you to fall in love with you first. I can't give you love that I can't give myself. And so I've learned that people who love me limitless are individuals who love themselves unashamedly. Individuals who can't love me wholly are individuals who have a whole part, a lot of parts of them that they're extremely unhappy with and they have not accepted their, their peculiarity. That's not my problem to manage. And so I no longer feel any kind of way with people who speak hate. I realize they hate themselves. There's more things about them that they hate. And so they can only give me what's inside of them. So I would say to even our listeners and our viewers, we have to stop 
um, feeding off of what people are giving us and feed off of what we're giving ourselves because it is we who are in charge of what we eat and how we process the things we eat. Boom. And I'm, and I'm gonna say this um, with the love aspect. I learned way earlier that love is not bipolar. No. And I've and that thing it, it irked me growing up because as um you said, you can love this part and then this is just absolutely no, no, no. And it's like love is not bipolar. If you love me, you love. And my grandmama always told me, I love you so much, I chastise you to make sure you get it right. And it's just I can never wrap my head around why you can love a certain part of me and not love the whole me. And I had to, that thing used to bother me so bad. And I think that's what damages our relationships with others and just not even sexual relationships, our friendships, partnerships. We take that love that we think that we learned and grew up on and try to emulate it mm -hmm. with others. And the it apostle, does not the work. Apostle, the apostle just talked about, you know, the schisms that go on in the church. I mean, think about the church and its radical audacity and suggested that we are, that, that, that Christ is married to the church. And we live in churches where we didn't see weddings and watch people blowing up marriage vows. It's like, <laughs> you ain't saying nothing good about Jesus if marriage is like what you and Miss Jackson do. You know what I mean? It's like these especially are when you're the pastor and you're sleeping with members in the church, impregnated them, and your wife pregnant with three kids, and all y'all in the same church, and we come to the church birthday. Y'all, y'all teaching something good. But we have to, we have to walk in that audacity because you're, you're right. If you're trying to break these yokes, if we're trying to get somebody to watch this in the middle of the country or in some big city in some massive church who's still being broken, it is daring to give yourself permission to study, to show yourself approved. Because you can, you can, I promise you, if you read the Bible, I promise you, some stuff will slap you upside the head again and again and again. again. You know, it's like, you, you know, if somebody wants to throw Sodom and Gomorrah at you and then Jesus speaks about Sodom and Gomorrah and speaks of inhospitality, unkindness and hoidiness. He does not mention, mention homosexuality and he talks about the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. But why would the church throw homosexuality under the bus when in unkindness, inhospitality, and hoidiness are on the table because a whole lot of church folk are unkind, hoity, and inhospita inhospitable. You know how? Oh, can I add, can I add one more? Greedy. Wrong seat. Huh? Say it again. Greedy. Greedy. Sit in the wrong seat and see what happened at some churches. But they want to talk about the love of Christ. We had a Sunday at my church one Sunday where a woman came, a white woman in the downtown New Brunswick, came in to sit in the church. And when my assistant pastor walked up to her to see how she could help her because she was clearly in, in, in distress, the woman spat in her face, this white woman. The whole, she said, pass this down to praise. The whole church stopped and we all went to the altar. That woman wailed for 20 minutes. She wow. thought she was, we were having service at an Episcopal church, a Protestant Presbyterian, by a, by a Presbyterian, the Presbyterian church. And she thought she was going to come in, sit in the pew, and have a moment. She didn't expect singing when she walked in. She didn't expect Holy Ghost when she walked in. And so she responded to it like, oh, let me do something outwardly so you can throw me out, because otherwise you're going to take me in. And we took her in. And that, that kind of radical audacity is why we're having this conversation while somebody's having Bible study. Somebody right. trying to preach about Sodom and Gomorrah. Somebody trying to get Levitical right now while we have the unmitigated audacity to talk mitigated. about the enormous love of Christ. We're talking about individuals who are living in their truth while individuals sit in these institutions, our institutions, even though some of us are not a part of that, like, and we do not address the level of suicide in our institutions the amount of divorces in our institutions, the amount of lack of responsibility and lack of achievement. Free is not an achievement. 
Okay, where are you investing in the world? Where are you investing in the community? Your investment got to be bigger than just the, the pulpit or Bible study or, or Sunday school director or choir director. Like, what are you doing outside of that? That is testament to the life of the quality of life on the inside of you. Quality of life. Say that 17 times. Yes. But, oh. but let me, if I could say something. And, and say something. I, I'm, it's just I, I I got to you know I'm the facilitator so I can just um put my wig on and take it off and oh, put it's it on. Pastoral privilege. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> the past the thing is, I had a conversation a couple months ago with somebody, and I had to correct them because you know Paul continued to take that Leviticus and move it into the New Testament. And I had to stop the individual. And I'm saying is, I have a question for you. And you say that you are a man of God, but I'm a little confused because what's happening with the, the and I hate to use the word also church, what's happening with ministry is we're not preaching Jesus, we're preaching Paul. And my understand, Paul is not Jesus. Paul is just someone who was killing the Christians. So my issue was it was Paul didn't understand what sexuality was first. And there was probably a question about Paul struggling with his own sexuality. That, what I, that which I do not want to do, I do. Baby, there ain't no question. There's no question. But how, how about even this? If y'all, I'm going to say this, I'm going to drop the bomb and walk out. Uh -huh. the, church, the church does not only preach you know, God, not, I mean, but not Jesus, but, but Paul, the church would rather Jesus have never existed because a lot of churches only right. talk Old Testament God. A lot of churches preach as though Jesus never existed. Right. And that is so true. And this conversation is good. And I, and I, and I know uh, we got some, we got a birthday person on here and then we got another one who got a birthday, but I, I, I want to kind of, ease this in so y'all can eat and enjoy and whatever it is but this is rich because what, what this is is need to be a part too because what god is speaking to me right now is since they ain't going to talk about sex why don't we talk about sex because somebody got to start talking about it now we do it well in the name of jesus but we don't talk about it so the theme for unity, what God gave me in January is evolving our consciousness. And um, I might lose some people here, but I came to understand because um, me and Ella Taylor is in an environment, a movement that thrives on progressiveness and liberation theology. And I've come to understand that God is a consciousness. And with that understanding is, do you feel that for one to evolve into being comfortable with their sexuality and their spirituality, do you believe it starts first in the consciousness? Because I've heard a couple of you saying unpack, unlearn. And I believe that the issue is we having a war within our consciousness of what's right, what's wrong, what I shouldn't do, what I don't do. And do you feel that if we start working like I'm doing now and for the next um, couple of years here in this ministry is helping people to evolve their consciousness to come out of what was told to them so they can connect to what is correct for them, if that made any sense. It makes plenty of sense to me. I, you know, my response to it would simply be this. Um, I think that the, the challenge is when I use the term unlearning or unpacking, what it's simply saying that, you know, we have this thing that we know we want to do, but then we act like we shame to do it. Even, and, and, and I mean, even married folks, if you talk to married people and ask them, how often do they talk about sexual activities in their marriage? Many of them would say they don't. Now, I'm just sorry. When I go to, when I went to school, I was learning something. When I went to college to, to do what I do in social work, I learned something. When I went to Bible school, I learned something. 
And so if I'm going to be in the bedroom with you, you're going to have to talk to me. We going we got to have class. And I think that whole level of community, I'm just sorry. I come for the whole experience. I want to A plus. I'm not satisfied with, with just mediocre. And, and that whole thought process, I shouldn't have to tell you. I, then you don't. That I don't that that's that is absurd. A, it's absurd. It's, it's absurd. absurd. Yeah. How how do you want? Oh, you you don't make me happy. You don't please me in the bedroom where you don't open your mouth. You got the talk. Tell, tell what you don't like, what Come you on. do like. I don't understand on. this. You know, on my job, if I do something my job I don't like, they'll write you up. I mean, in my world, you know, and if uh, do it too long, they'll fire you. And some people get divorced because they don't want to talk. In their, so that's when I say I'm learning a big of it, a big part of it is the lack of communication and the and 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 comfortableness with that one of the panelists shared earlier with just being, you know, we, we, we're uncomfortable in, in too many aspects of having what we call hard conversations. Putting you the mind that is in Christ Jesus, the same mind in you. And you talk about evolving your consciousness. Jesus was so involved that they murdered him. Yes. He was so involved that they somehow, some, and sometimes don't even want to talk about the ways that he talked, right? That's right. I, you know, what's powerful for me, uh, Pastor and, 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 and Apostle, what's powerful for me is having done this work. It wasn't, oh my God, in order to love myself, I got to unpack and unlearn. So, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, I got to understand the other 714 Levitical codes. God took me to Matthew 16 in the conversation with Jesus. Who do people say I am? It's real talk with a dude. Who do people say I am? And it was Peter was like, I, some people say you're Elijah. Some people say you're another spirit can return. He, he said, so who do you say I am? I say you're the son of the living God. Jesus goes, see, only my daddy could have told you that. Only. I didn't tell, liars. I didn't tell anybody. Only my daddy could have told you that. A part, you know, what is loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. What is bound on earth shall be bound in heaven. He yes. said, and upon that rock shall I, I will build my church. And the then he said to me. Peter, the thing that the church got, it keeps getting wrong. Then he said to Peter, in front of us people, don't tell nobody this, right? Fast forward to Jesus on the precipice of being crucified. And he says uh, to Peter, while they gathered, he said, you know, it's, it's so time for things to move in right order that before the cock crows three times, you will deny me. And Peter's like, wait a minute. Peter ready to pull his knife out again like he did in the garden and cut somebody in Jesus' name. And he mm -hmm. said, I would never, I would never deny you. You my dude. I've been here with you since the beginning. And Jesus has this moment, right? When you talk about evolution, where Jesus says like, wait a minute, dude. Listen to me, we boys. Before the cock crows three times, you will deny me. And Peter's tears were not shame. They were, oh my God, this is my assignment. The loud one who would cut everybody has to be quiet because if you talk, they go squawk and I've got to die. So Peter, watch your mouth. And so to see that for me, when people like Peter the denier and they want to berate, you know, best friends will deny you. Know what I'm saying? So he followed Jesus's order to the letter. That's why the tears were there because he wanted to, Peter would have, if Peter had his human way, He'd have pulled out his sword and assassinated yes, at least 10 guards. Yes, he would have. But that wasn't the assignment. For yes. us, the assignment is to have yes. the mitigated audacity to talk about sex with the lights on, sexuality with the with the collar on. Hello, somebody. So that somebody can see that we are wonderfully and fearfully made. And it's no accident when you're when you slow dance and somebody tests the small of your back that everything you love about them moves through your body at one time. It's no accident that you kiss your mouth and feel nothing and kiss your man and feel everything. Mm -hmm. Come on. My God. Um, but I, I will say this that it does start um with the mind. <clears throat> and I say that because even when you're growing up as a child, that's what they're constantly drilling into you. Information, information, information. And your mind is like a sponge. And the things that you learn is what you regurgitate. And you can't regurgitate something that you have not learned. So we have gone through the years of not wanting to learn this, but just by sitting in a room. And this is another plug. We got to be careful who we sit around. That's right. Because those things you don't always necessarily pick up on, but because it's in your air gates, 
you get those seeds and now they start manifesting in your mind That's and right. now you wondering why well hold on why am i regurgitating all? i was in the midst of something i should not have been in the midst of and we as the body of christ on our pulpits are saying and dropping these seeds and then we sometimes as pastors this is me included wonder why my people acting so crazy but like what is going I have dropped that seed in them. And now that it's manifesting itself, now I want to do something about it. Or now I want to act some kind of way about it. But now, hold on. They're only doing what I instruct, as you just said, with Peter. (laughs) They're doing what I have now dropped into them. And me as a person, I had to learn that, yes, every environment is not for me. However, if I'm going to be in this environment and I know that it's about to be detrimental to me, I know it's y'all have a good night or I no longer um, need to be a part of this conversation because my place where I am now in God, I will never let somebody, never let somebody dictate or derail me back to that place. So um, our conscience has a lot to do with how we maneuver, how we interact with each other. And it's all based on, I hate to say, those seeds that have been dropped even years ago, even though I'm in this community. And I posted this the other day on my page. I still have biases amongst those who are in my community based upon some seeds that have been dropped years ago that I am yet still trying to, you know, rework that thing. And I have to be careful with these girls that I have now. They're only six and three. And some of the things that they say because of where they come from and we take them to church and they see the total opposite, like, we're same loving. There's a straight couple over there. There's some Asians over there. And they are like overstimulated. And they're like, I don't know which way to turn. <laughs> but this is why we're exposing this to you as a young lady. And as everyone has said, when they go to that bathroom, there's no reason why I need to be in there. You make sure you um get, I'm showing you one time how to do it. And it is now on you. And you don't ever let anybody... They called me from the school because she was having a hissy fit. Y'all not going in the bathroom with me. And she was having a hissy fit. And I said, no, that's not what we do at our house. But these are things that I am dropping seeds in this child that wherever or however or whomever you choose to love, this is how you are treated. And this is your boundary. And this is what they don't cross. But we don't teach that so that it is instilled in their mind. So when they are teenagers and they get curious, my papa has already taught me <laughs> like this is my boundary if I choose to or this is how I need to go about doing this but we do not give ourselves that and I will say this before I end give yourself grace as an adult because you can't beat yourself up because of the environment that you could not change so give yourself grace because I was hard on myself as an adult. And I realized that I should have given myself grace because there's nothing that I could do about whom I was birthed to. <laughs> so those environments I could not control, but give yourself grace. Exactly. Well, y'all, this is, we can go on for another hour and I see my- I need that book. Let me tell you, let me tell a quick story, right? This is so unpacking what both of y'all said. See this book right here? I was in a Lutheran church for a unity service once down in DC and saw this book on the shelf and the title hit me so hard that it stayed with me forever. Afterwards, I intended to go get the book and you know see if I could borrow it and we left and I couldn't get it. And then years later, it stayed with me. And so one day I ordered it on Amazon. I found the old copy so old that, you know, that it split there. And I just held on to it and God was like, no, no, no. I didn't get that book to just look at it, read it. And so I sat down and I was preparing for ser- you know, sermons and read the introduction. And so the on not leaving it to the snake is this. This author, Harvey Cox, is saying 
that, the, that for so long the human struggle with that, our great sin was pride. We did what we wanted to do, and that's why we got in trouble. Eve wow. ate the apple. Adam didn't follow in lead in leadership, and that was the problem. What he says in this book is that the great sin of man, mankind, humankind, was not pride. It mm. was sloth, and that we, in our faith fight, were lazy enough to leave our entire destiny to a snake. Mm. Mm. That's and a what good, was that's powerful a good for me, what was powerful for me, and I can show that, you know, this is another thing I get to bear witness to somebody. What was really powerful for me when I took this on a cruise with me uh, just, just, just this past August, I was on a cruise in, uh, uh, through Alaska, right? And it says uh, in the liner notes, it says the Commonwealth Publishing for Kafka, East and West from the September 4th, 1964 issue of Commonwealth, right? So the original thought on this book was written on September 4th, 1964. My birthday wow. is September 4th, 1964. Wow. So this thing about consciously and, and, and allowing God to move in your subconscious and all the ways that God is trying to whisper to you, psst, psst. what day was that? What time is it? Do that. Look down and you're like, that's a $20 bill. A hundred people walked on that street and didn't see that $20 bill. Or you're in your closet, you're struggling. You got to put, the, put that blue jacket on. You go in and go, it's an old wallet, and the old wallet got $100 in it. So not only is God providing the $100 now when you desperately need it, clearly God was doing so much blessing that you didn't need the 100 when you got it. That's who we are. That's whose we are. And these conversations are going to be game changers. We might end up being on a podcast together, y'all, because some people need <laughs> this. Some people yes. need this. Well, I am so grateful and we continue to go on, but the, the powerful thing for me is this conversation tonight. And, and, and I would love to have all three of y'all back if you came back, but be, if you come back, because the thing is we have to have these dialogues and this, and as the pastor and the, the CEO, I wanted to have these mind bothering conversations to help those unpack and get things is, you know, and I have to say this before I let y'all close out tonight with whatever it is. I, 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 I was thinking about Donnie McCurkin and this man is not physically dying, but he's mentally and spiritually dying Watch everybody is watching him because they have not gave him to permission to be who he is mm -hmm. and and it's sad that it's come to a place that kirk franklin and all of his little crew will celebrate this man dying of a premature death to be something that you don't want him to be and that really began when I began to think about how I wish somebody could reach out to him and help him connect his sexuality to his spirituality and let him know that he is okay because he is like so many that in that gospel arena who is suppressing themselves. Donnie McCurkin looks like he's 79 years old and he's only in his 60s. Wow. And this is the reason why I wanted to have these is because it's no need for people to turn into Donnie McCurkins and become free. So I'm glad we having this conversation. I'm glad that we uh, may be helping someone. And um, now we have a YouTube um, channel and um, praise God with that. Um, maybe more people will be enlightening. So as we wrap up this, this tonight, I, I wanted to give each one of you an opportunity to, uh, uh, to drop a loaf of bread, or, a, a candy bar, or something wonderful so that the people can go. Because I, I know some people are unraveling now. I know some people then went in and fixed them a good cocktail because we didn't had a good conversation. So if there's any last little thing that y'all want to say, before I let y'all go and do what you got to do, one 
um, birthdays got to finish with the husband and another one got to prepare for the birthday tomorrow. So <laughs> I, I'll mention that when we close out. But do y'all have anything that you want to close out for the people and for their ears and their consciousness? I'm going to say this one real quick so that the birthday brothers get all the time they need. You know, Dr. Phil has a statement that says, hurt people hurt people, right? And we know how that is and how that moves and has lived in the legacy of us as people in this country, right? And for the longest, I was sitting with God, like, well, what can, you know, bless people, bless people? How do, what, what can I do to balance that out? And I couldn't find a word because hurt people hurt people is the same statement repeated, right? So you can't say save people, save people, because they're not the same word. And I was sitting down with it one day and, and literally got boing on me up from my bed and said, Kevin, say it out loud. And I was like, oh, free people, free people. Mm -hmm. That's the assignment for us. Free people, free people. Free people. Happy birthday. <laughs> Happy rebirthday. <laughs> somebody just got born again. How? Yeah. Come on, Holy <laughs> Ghost God. Hello. Yeah, that's, yes, that's for all again. Yeah. Yes, well, somebody that. got free. Somebody called their mama and said, honey, I'm a lesbian, I'm gay, I'm queer, I'm transgender, honey. I heard something in the night, honey, that was better than the gospel because you know that we are the living gospels. You know, the oh, six God. books did not end with us. So uh -huh. I praise God that this gospel from each one of us will continue until somebody takes liberation. Anyway, go ahead. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Um, I guess I'll go then. Um, I do want to... Um, encourage everyone that you are not alone amen and don't ever feel alone um i commented in the chat if you need to reach out to me anyone on this panel but speak to someone because you are not alone and again give yourself grace and those are my brothers and sisters who are in the community or just allies to the community. Let us all begin to have listening ears um, and be able to receive someone where they are. Because it's not only our job to listen, but we are also to help build them and encourage them to be more and better than what they are. Um, because at the end of the day, we are all here for a purpose and an assignment. And your purpose and your assignment is not dictated by your sexuality or by whom you may choose to sleep with. It is dictated by the one who created you. So please live on purpose, serve your purpose, and do all that God has called you to be. Because those things that are at your hands and your fingertips, somebody is waiting for just that one thing. And you cannot be the detriment to what they need. Go out and be all that God created you to be. And when you speak, speak with authority, with your head held high, and do it in the name that you call every day in Amen. Jesus name don't let nobody nobody no demon in hell take your voice your voice is what the enemy wants because if you speak it because you have the power it shall come to pass so please please don't let your voice be silenced and also happy birthday to my other June birthday <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I'm eternally grateful. And again, it's an honor to be on here tonight. Thank you so much, Reverend Aaron Jean, for thinking of me to extend such an invite. And, and what I want to, to leave, you know, um, when a mother births a baby, if the umbilical cord is connected too long, it can produce too many red blood cells, resulting in blood poisoning of the baby which could lead to that baby dying. I want to encourage you tonight that don't allow yourself to be connected to things too long that has served its purpose. And now you're experiencing dying moments. God charged us to live. And my encouragement to you is to live. Cut off what needs to be cut off. There is a breath of people. Um, I was with Bishop, um, my God, Yvette Flander years ago at a conference. I, I, I really believe um, Reverend Taylor was there as well. 
And she said to us, we were in Raleigh. We were, yes, you were. You were sitting in the front. Yes, she was. I remember. We were in Raleigh and she preached about this bowl. And at the end of the message, she said, I love being higher up. The air is so free up here. To you who are below, just come on up. And so tonight I echo those words. Come on up. I'm telling you, it's plenty of air here and it's light. Amen. Amen. I praise God for each one of you. Happy birthday, Apostle Montgomery and 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 my uh, my my dear brother. I, 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 we, we're going to have to have a little talk, um, Pastor um, Benjamin, and your birthday tomorrow and my dear elder and everything else. I'm excited. Um, this is not the end. God is really just speaking to me and I know this was a discussion, but I had to um, put it in because I've heard Grace speaking to me and this has to continue. So um, I, I'm so grateful for this. Um, I also want to remind everyone that we do meet first and third Sunday of each month. Um, that we are meeting on um, Ju July the 2nd at 11 a.m. Um, and God is still doing great things at Unity. And I praise God that I, I got a confirmation tonight because this is the first time um, I'm stepping out of my boat of preaching. And um, um, my, the theme for this month that God gave me since we have this independence and everything is, is revisiting um, our um, Exodus experience. Oh. And the title of my sermon is we are in one hell of a law, law, war of our liberation. We are in one hell of a war. And I'm so grateful for each one of you tonight. I'm grateful for this conversation. Um, please know that if you leave any comments, me and my student clergy will get to you. I know that my panelists has left their information. And it's wonderful that we are um, from a movement, a denomination, independent, and we have come together as unification to give this word. So I thank each one of you again, and may God bless you, and may the birthday men have a wonderful elder. You know that I love you, and I will see you in October if I don't look see you. In and so you know that I love y'all. Y'all be blessed, and you take love care. Have a wonderful Happy birthday to you. Hey, 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 Happy hey, hey, birthday. hey. Amen, Happy amen. Y'all be blessed now, and take care.